All right guys, so today I'm gonna to show you guys how to flush an AC system. There are two main reasons really why you would ever need to flush an AC system. The first and most common reason is gonna be a compressor failure. If your compressor fails, typically it's gonna send metal shrapnel throughout the entire AC system. You're gonna to have to get all those metal particles and all that garbage out of the lines before you put a new compressor on, otherwise you're gonna destroy a brand new compressor. The second reason that you would ever have to flush an AC system, like in my case, is basically the person that was working on it screwed up. So like I alluded to a second ago, the AC system in this car that we're gonna be dealing with in this video is an AC system that I myself screwed up. Um, basically to make a long story short, what happened was a couple years back, I rebuilt the AC system in this car. Uh, new lines, new condenser, new compressor, the whole, the whole thing basically with the exception of the evaporator. I installed all brand new Motorcraft from Ford parts, you know, brand new compressor, brand new lines, yada, yada, yada. Got everything working, everything worked great, except for the fact that the AC compressor that was brand new from Ford leaked. Um, so I had to go through, get a warranty compressor through Ford installed another brand new AC compressor on the system. When I did all this, each one of those compressors came pre-charged with oil. So the first time I changed the compressor, when I changed all the lines at the condenser and everything, the system had the correct amount of oil in it, everything was fine. When I changed to the second compressor, the second compressor also came pre-charged with seven ounces of oil. The, the system capacity in this car is only eight ounces. So I effectively had twice the amount of oil as what I should have had in this car. And like I said, it's 100% my fault. As far as flushing these systems, guys, it does not matter if the system is overcharged or full of metal shrapnel or anything like that. The procedure is gonna be exactly the same no matter what your situation is if you have to flush the system. So before you go ripping and tearing and open your system up, take a look at everything and try to establish what direction the refrigerant actually flows in the system. So for example, my compressor's down here at the bottom. This line right here loops around and comes over and goes into the condenser over here. So this line is the outlet and it flows this way toward the front of the car. So when I flush this line, I wanna flush it the opposite direction that it normally flows. So you're gonna back flush everything. The thing is, if I flush it in the direction of normal flow, if there is metal garbage or shrapnel or whatever in this line, if you flush it forward, you're just gonna drive it further into the line. If you flush it backward, you're gonna drive all that stuff back out of the line the way it came in. In my situation, because I'm mostly just flushing oil, it's not a big deal, but like I said, if you're dealing with a contaminated system, you have to figure out what direction it flows in and how to actually back flush everything. Don't drive it further into the system. So the first thing you guys need to do is you need to take the vehicle somewhere and have the refrigerant properly recovered. Um, have somebody pull the refrigerant out of the system, have them pull a vacuum on the system. That way you can bring the car home or wherever you're working on the vehicle and then you can go ahead and pull everything apart. So the way that I am flushing this system, I am flushing every component individually. So what I'm doing is I'm pulling all the lines, the dryer, the compressor, as well as the condenser. The only thing that I'm not removing from this car is the evaporator inside the dash. And the only reason I'm not removing the evaporator is just simply because it's so much labor for me to remove this evaporator. It's right next to the heater core in the, in the uh, HVAC box in the dash. It's probably between four to eight hours of labor for me to replace this thing, or at least, you know, take it out to clean it. So in my situation, I'm flushing everything individually. That way I can tell if the components are actually clean or not. So as far as flushing individual components, guys, I'm gonna show you how to do it on this dryer. Do not flush a dryer, just replace it. Like I said, my system's already put back together, therefore I don't have any hoses to demonstrate on. So all you're gonna do is take the end of your hose and take your flush and stick it in the end 
hit the trigger if you're using the aerosol. The end of the hose will have a rubber seal on it, so it should seal, and you're just gonna wait for it to come out the other end. Obviously, like I said, you're gonna do this in the opposite direction of normal flow. So you're gonna flush the solvent backward through the system. If you are using a pressurized container to flush out everything, those are pretty simple as well. All you're gonna do is unscrew the can off of it, dump your solvent into the can, thread the can back on, hook it to shop air, and then you can take the end of the hose, stick it in whatever hose that um, needs to be flushed, flush it back, flush it that way. Um, it's really just gonna depend on whether you're using aerosol like I am, or the, uh, you know, the higher grade uh, professional style tool. Once you have the solvent ran through everything, guys, the next thing you need to do is flush everything with compressed air. Um, take everything off, run compressed air through everything, forward, backward. You wanna make sure as much of the solvent is out of the system as possible. Um, the solvent does not lubricate. So if you leave the solvent in the system, it's gonna cause damage to the compressor because it doesn't lubricate. The other thing is it doesn't cool, so you may or may not have cooling issues depending on how much solvent you have in the system. I've even read things online from uh, Four Seasons who makes AC components. They said any, anything that you flush with solvent, they want you to run compressed air through it for 40 minutes to make sure that there is absolutely zero uh, solvent left in the system. Okay, so let's go over all the things in the system that you cannot flush. First of which, the condenser. You cannot flush the condenser. I do not care what anybody tells you, don't do it. Just replace it. Because, first of all, most of the condensers that are out on the market range between $50 and $150. How many cans do you think I'm gonna have to run through this thing at 25 bucks a can to get this thing cleaned out. Just replace it. It's gonna be cheaper in the long run to replace the thing. The other thing is, even if you want to flush this thing, the big problem is all these little tubes that you see here, like all these tubes along the side, this is actually what carries the refrigerant, these solid tubes in the middle. The passages inside those tubes are extremely small. So, if I try to flush this backward over here on the side, if I try to run solvent backwards through this thing, I have to get solvent all the way through this and out over here. Guys, it's never gonna happen. It's gonna save you money and time in the long run to just eat it and replace it if your system's contaminated. That's what I did because I have no idea how much oil's in this thing. I can't get all the oil out of this thing. So therefore, for 50 bucks, I'm just gonna replace it and move on. Next thing is, is gonna be the accumulator, the dryer, um, whatever you guys wanna call it. Basically, there's a bag of desiccant in the bottom of this thing that it absorbs any moisture that naturally occurs in the system while the system is in use. If there's garbage in the bottom of this container, you will never get all the garbage out of the bottom of this thing. Just replace it. These things are kinda of like the, uh, the condenser. I can buy one for this car for like 20 bucks. Again, a can of flush is 25. So just spend the money, replace these things. The next thing you cannot flush is gonna be either the orifice tube or expansion valve, depending on the, uh, the type of system that you have. This is an orifice tube system. And if you guys look at this thing, it's essentially, it's a filter for the system. Um, so if there's any garbage that makes it through the condenser, it's gonna get caught by the, uh, the orifice tube and you're probably gonna have some metal particles and metal garbage stuck in the orifice tube. The orifice tube for this car is $6. Just replace it. You'll spend more on flush than what you will just replacing it. Um, next thing is any line with a muffler in it. All the recommendations that I saw online that any line that has a muffler in it needs to be replaced. Um, there's, there's no guarantees that you're gonna get all the metal garbage and all the contamination out of a muffler. Um, I did not replace the muffler in my case because I just simply had too much oil in the system. So I flushed my, my line that had the muffler in it. I just flushed it out both directions, made sure that the flush solvent came out clean and clear on both ends and 
blew it out with compressed air and sent it on its way. It's my system works fantastic. So the final thing you cannot flush guys is gonna be the compressor. The thing is with the compressor, if you try to flush it with the solvent, the solvent is gonna basically clean out all the oil that's in the compressor and there's a potential that you could still have residual solvent in the compressor and when you go to start the system up, it's not gonna have any lubrication. It's just gonna have solvent in it. So nine times out of 10, if your system is contaminated with metal particles and just you know the black sludge or the, the black death as mechanics call it, you're replacing the compressor anyway. So there's no reason for you guys to flush it. Um, the rest of the lines, you know, the evaporator, all that stuff, you can go ahead and just run the flush through it. Um, it's gonna take some time, but these are all the things that honestly just replace it i don't care what it costs it's going to cost you a fortune in flush rather than uh you know a fortune in parts now as far as flushing out my system i'm starting with the evaporator in the dash and the way i'm doing this is i'm running the solvent backward through the evaporator so what that's doing is it's going to break loose and clean any of the gunk that's built up in the evaporator. My evaporator flows um, in the bottom uh, tube out the top. So when I flush it, I'm gonna flush it in the top and out the bottom, just reverse of normal flow. My recommendation is if you're gonna use these aerosol cans like I am, do the evaporator first because the evaporator is gonna take a lot more solvent than what you think and the hoses really don't take much solvent at all to get them cleaned out. So you're gonna use the majority of your cleaning solvent on the evaporator. So do that first while the can's full. Once you have each component completely flushed out with the solvent, the next thing that I did was I took shop air and I ran shop, clean, dry shop air through all these lines through the evaporator through all this stuff to try and remove as much of that flushing solvent as you can. Yes, the vacuum that you're gonna pull on the system will boil off the solvent, but if I can remove the majority of it with compressed air, I'm gonna do that. You need to get all the solvent out of the system. So before we add oil to the system, we need to spend a minute actually talking about oil. So. All OEM manufacturers that use R134A all recommend some sort of PAG oil. PAG oil comes in three different viscosities. There is a PAG 46, which I have here. There's a PAG 100. There's also a PAG 150. That refers to the viscosity, like I said, of the oil. Now the oil that I have here also has UV dye in it. So you can get PAG 46 in clear, you can get PAG 46 with UV dye. The UV dye just makes it easier to find leaks. Now going back to viscosity. So if you take a system that's designed for PAG 46 and you put like PAG 150 in it, the system is still gonna work. The compressor and everything's still gonna function like it should. What you may have issues with is the system, first of all, when the compressor turns on, it's gonna require more horsepower from the engine than what PAG 46 will because it's a little bit lower viscosity. Second thing is it may not cool quite like it's supposed to. So if you have cooling performance issues, you may have used the wrong oil. Something to keep in mind. Um, in addition to this, if you have a hybrid or electric vehicle, they also make a dielectric PAG oil because the AC compressor in hybrid or electric vehicles is driven by an electric motor. It's not driven by uh, you know, the serpentine belt on the engine. So they have a special oil just for hybrid electric vehicles that if you guys have one of those, you need to buy the right oil for it. In addition to that, if you guys have the newer refrigerant, the uh, 1234YF, they, have, they specify a certain type of PAG oil for those systems as well. So as you can see, there's a lot to the oil. Um, what I'm gonna do for you guys is down in the description, I'm gonna take you to Supercool's website. On Supercool's website, they have a year make model lookup. And what that'll tell you is they will tell you the type of oil that's required for your system, the amount of oil that's required for your system, and then there's other general uh, AC system specifications listed on there. 
So rather than me, uh, you know, trying to make recommendations in the video, I'm just going to send you over there and you're going to get all the information that you possibly need. Now at this point, I'm going to put my AC system mostly back together, um, putting the condenser back in, putting the hoses in. The only thing that I'm leaving disassembled at this point is going to be the compressor and possibly the dryer, depending on what style of system you have. So now that you know the quantity and the type of oil you need, I'm going to tell you guys how to actually add it into the system because believe it or not, each system may be a little bit different depending on the type of compressor you're dealing with, whether or not you have an orifice tube or expansion valve in your system. So first thing we're going to go over, if you have a variable displacement compressor, typically they have a plug on the back of them that you can tell if it's a variable displacement or not. Those compressors also typically have some sort of drain bolt on the crankcase to drain the oil out. In that situation, those compressors, all you're going to do is you're going to take the total amount of oil required for the system and dump it into the crankcase. Put the plug back in it, send it on its way. That setup's about as easy as it gets. Um, this vehicle that I'm dealing with in particular, this is a Ford FS10 compressor which is a cycling compressor. It's not variable displacement. Most of the, the older stuff like this is not variable displacement. So what you're gonna do in those instances on a non-variable displacement compressor that does not have a crankcase, you're gonna take half of the required amount of oil and dump it in the suction line of the compressor. You're gonna take the other half of the oil charge for the system and you're either gonna put it in the dryer or the evaporator and that is going to depend on whether or not you have an orifice tube or not so no matter what if you do not have a crank crankcase half the oil goes in the compressor this car has an orifice tube set up so half of my my other half of my oil charge is going to go in my dryer so if i had a vehicle with a thermal expansion valve you are not going to put the oil in the dryer you're going to put the oil in the evaporator in the dash, the other half of your oil charge. Um, what can happen if you put the other half of your oil charge in the dryer on a thermal expansion valve system? There, it's going to take a long time for that oil to make it through the uh, thermal expansion valve and the compressor may run for a period of time without good lubrication. So thermal expansion valve, Put the half charge in the evaporator, orifice tube set up, put the half charge in the dryer. No matter what, unless it is a variable displacement, you're going to put half of the charge in the suction line of the compressor. So once you get your system all put back together, before you start the vehicle up or start pulling vacuum on anything, there's one thing you absolutely need to do no matter what type of compressor is in the vehicle. You need to turn the input of the compressor in the direction that it normally rotates when the vehicle is running. You need to turn it at least between 10 and 20 times. What that's going to do is that's going to ensure that that compressor isn't going to hydro lock. So because you dump that oil in the suction side of the compressor, there's a potential that when the engine turns on and you turn the compressor on, there's a potential that the compressor could hydro lock and it's gonna destroy itself if it hydro locks. So what that, by turning the input, that's gonna keep that compressor from hydro locking and just causing damage. So make sure you do that before um, you, know, you start charging the system, pulling vacuum, you know, driving the vehicle around in any way, shape or form. Just make sure you don't have a giant charge of oil sitting in the compressor when you start it up. All right guys, so as you can see, I've got everything all back together here. Now, there's one major thing that you need to do before you just dump refrigerant in this thing and just turn it on and see what happens. You need to pull a vacuum on the system. So this is a vacuum pump. And what this thing does is it will connect to the middle line or the yellow line on your manifold gauge set. Uh, this is normally the line that you would use to charge the system. It'll hook right to uh, one of these vacuum pumps. You turn on the vacuum pump open up your valves and just let this thing sit here and run for an extended period of time. Um, we'll get into that in a second. So first of all, why do you want to use a vacuum on your system? Well, 
by pulling a vacuum on the system, it's really gonna do two things. So the first thing is it's gonna boil off any moisture that's left in the system. So when you take water at room temperature and you expose it to a high vacuum level, it will make that water boil. So if you let the water boil long enough, you will boil out all the water that's in the system. So what that's doing for you is it's removing any residual water or moisture that's in the system. So when you charge it, you're only putting refrigerant in the system. There's only refrigerant and oil in the system. That's what you want. You don't want any moisture in there because the moisture isn't gonna lubricate the compressor like it should, and it's not gonna cool correctly. Now, the main reason that we're using the vacuum for this video and the people watching this video is the vacuum pump will also boil off all that flushing solvent that I ran through the system and through all these lines and through the evaporator and the dash. So by hooking up the vacuum pump, running the, uh, the vacuum pump on the system, it's gonna boil out any moisture, any flushing solvent. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna ensure that obviously there's nothing in the system other than the refrigerant and the oil, and that's really what you want. As far as how long you need to run the vacuum pump, guys, the service data that I have on this car from Ford says whenever you run solvent through the system, you need to pull a vacuum on the system for at least a half hour. I'm probably gonna do like an hour, hour and a half just to be safe. Um, you really can't hurt anything by pulling a vacuum on it longer than what's really recommended. Um, like I said, Ford said at a minimum, do it for a half hour. So. That's what I'm gonna do here, guys. I'm gonna get this thing running, get this thing going. Once I have this thing going, I'm gonna bring you guys back and show you, um, you can also leak check it with a vacuum on it. All right, so I'm about done with the vacuum pump, but don't just turn the vacuum pump off. Make sure you close your valves before you do anything with the vacuum pump. So you're gonna close both valves, then turn the vacuum pump off. Then what you can do is come up here and just watch this low pressure gauge and just make sure it doesn't move. Give it like between five and 20 minutes. Make sure it doesn't go anywhere. If it starts bleeding vacuum off immediately, you have a leak somewhere. You need to find it. To find a leak um, in this scenario, what I would do, like if anything under here was leaking, I would take some of my shop air and just charge the, the system with shop air to put some pressure in the system so I can see where possibly is it leaking. So once I have some pressure in it, you know, take some soapy water, go around, spray all your connections, see where the bubbles come from, and then go ahead and check that connection. I'm gonna let this thing sit probably about 10 or 15 minutes or so, and then we're gonna come back and I'm gonna start dumping refrigerant in this thing. All right guys, so it's been about 15 minutes or so. I fired the car up, let the car run a little bit because I pulled the radiator out. I want to make sure my cooling system was all completely bled out, got all the air pockets out of the cooling system. So I'm good to go there. After I got that done, I came back, checked my gauges. My gauges are still showing about 30 inches of water, which is really is about all the vacuum you can ever pull. Um, most amount of vacuum you can pull is 29 and a half. So as long as you're holding after five to 15 minutes, you're usually good to go on charging it. So as far as charging it, guys, typically there's a sticker underneath the hood up here or down here somewhere that'll tell you the amount of refrigerant that the system will take. Um, in the case of this Mustang, so it takes 34 ounces. Each one of these cans is typically about 12 ounces. So I need just under three full cans to fill this system. So as far as the refrigerant, obviously, if you have an R134A, make sure you're buying 134A. If you have a newer uh, 1234 system, make sure you're putting 1234 in it and not 134A. Um, something to be super mindful of because recovering contaminated systems that are mixed with 134A and other refrigerants gets pretty expensive. As far as the refrigerant itself, guys, I typically buy the cheap stuff. The thing is, when you buy the cheap stuff, there's no extra oil, there's no stop leak, there's no other stupid additives that, frankly, I don't really think you need, especially in my sort of situation because I know how much oil is in this system, so I don't want to add extra oil. I, but my system has enough oil, and it's too capacity at this point as far as oil is concerned. I just want refrigerant. So some of these cans will come with oil, they will come with stop leak, and they will not tell you how much oil is in the can. 
So they don't tell you how much is refrigerant, how much is oil. So when you buy the, uh, <clears throat> so when you buy the cans with stop leak or extra oil, you don't know how much oil you're putting in there. The other thing is about refrigerant, guys. There's a bunch of stuff out there on the market that's, oh, it's synthetic refrigerant. It, you know, this is cold. It's the coldest. It does this. It does that, and blah blah blah. There's a lot of marketing around refrigerant for some reason. I'll be honest with you guys. I think 99% of it is pretty much all BS. Um, if your system is functioning and working correctly, the system does not care what refrigerant you put in it. It's gonna get cold either way if the system works correctly. Go into any shop that buys like the big 20 pound containers of refrigerant for their AC machines, ask them if it's synthetic and it's the coldest. They're not gonna know because typically when you buy those bulk containers, all that marketing crap completely goes away. So to actually charge this system, guys, all I'm doing, I've got this can adapter. It just threads on the top of the can. The can adapter hooks to the yellow line that we use for the vacuum pump. And then what you're gonna do is once you have the yellow line hooked to the can, thread the, the top of the can down, or the, uh, the adapter down onto the can, I guess, you're gonna open the low side valve. That is gonna let the refrigerant flow into the low side of the system. If you connect this up to the yellow line and you open the red valve, the pressure in the high side is greater than the pressure in the can, therefore you are going to empty the system and push the pressure and the refrigerant from the system into the can. You will probably blow up the can. That's why typically when you go to the store and you buy one of those AC recharge kits, they only come with one hose because they only want you putting it in the low side. It's kind of a liability thing. So that's what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna hook this thing up, get this thing charged up, and uh, we're gonna see what this turns out like. So that's going in guys. The thing is, the first can, since you have the vacuum on it, the vacuum in the system is gonna pull a lot of this out of the can. Um, typically, if the system's empty, it's never gonna let the compressor turn on. If the, if the compressor doesn't turn on, as far as the cans are concerned, it's hard to charge. So I'm gonna go in, start the car up, valves are open, go in, turn the AC on, and uh, we're gonna start filling this thing. So I've got everything all charged. Here are my pressures. So my low side pressures at idle is running about 25 PSI. My high side pressure is about 175 PSI. Both of these are sort of on the low end for my ambient temperature right now. So my ambient temperature is about 80 degrees, give or take. So this thing should be running about 200 and about 40. It's a little low, but I'm getting tons and tons of cool air out of the vents. So I'm really not gonna screw with it. I'm gonna leave it exactly how it is. I have the right amount of refrigerant in it. Um, if I rev this thing up, you'll see the pressures change a little bit. And actually, uh, if you look down below, one of the uh, AC lines actually has a bunch of frost on it. So it's if I go much colder than what I am now, I'm gonna start freezing up the evaporator and then I'm gonna lose all air conditioning. So guys, check it out. I got the car running here and uh, we're looking just under 40 degrees, probably 38, 37 degrees. That's right about perfect. Um, overall, super happy with how it turned out. Unfortunately, you know, I was the one that screwed it up to begin with, but I made it right, so it is what it is. Um, guys, as always, I'll have links down in the description to the solvent, to all the tools, and then to the information that I talked about in the video as far as the different types of oil, where I'll find all that stuff. Um, as always guys, if you guys like the video, hit like. You want to see more content, go around and hit subscribe. Thanks for watching guys.